Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started if you want to take your seats. Okay, so uh, my name is Kurt Griffiths. I am a architect at Rackspace Hosting, and uh, I work on the Marconi project, which is the, the, the code name for the uh, uh, message queuing uh, service program that OpenStack has. Um, today, we'd like to give you a brief overview of the project. Uh, we're gonna walk through the API and also talk a little bit about the architecture. Um, we've also got a live demo prepared for you, so you can see Marconi in action. And we'll finish up w with uh, some frequently asked questions, and then we'll have some time, of course, for, uh, for y'all to ask us what, whatever's on your mind. Okay, so um, in, uh, in the late 1800s, a young Italian by the name of Marconi began to uh, play around with radio electronics in his uh, attic of his family's home, and he would go on to, uh, along with a few other visionaries, revolutionize the way the world communicated. Um, wireless had two key advantages over the alternatives. First, it allowed the sender of the message and the receiver to be loosely coupled. Second, it uh, afforded a wide variety of communications patterns. It was very flexible and you could apply it to a lot of different problems. So with the Marconi project, we hope to bring these same kinds of advantages to cloud applications communicating through the internet. We envision Marconi applying to a variety of application domains, anything from e-commerce to software as a service to social applications. Uh, so let me let me just take you through some of the operations that you can do with the API. So this is these are things that uh, a cloud application developer would um, would use in order to do some of those things that we just mentioned. Um, but before I get into some of the details, uh, it's helpful to understand that the Marconi API is based on two fundamental concepts. First, you have a message feed. Um, you can kind of think of this like a RSS or an Atom feed where you can post messages up there, you can list them. Um, there's uh, no, no uh, as you list messages, other people can see them as well, so you're not hiding them from anyone. There's also the notion of a claim, and a claim is where I can grab a batch of messages and um, they're mine. So you would use this for job queuing where you have workers who are processing things and, and you only want one worker at a time to be working on, on a single message. So those are the basic concepts and we actually have put these both in the same API and that enables hybrid messaging patterns. So you can have, for example, um, you might be processing um, billing invoices. Uh, maybe you're converting them to PDF files. You can have a auditor process that's just watching the feed of messages fly by and logging those. And so if you ever have a problem or, or a customer calls and says, hey, I missed my invoice, you can go back and track that. So that's just one example of how you can use this hybrid model. Um, and out of those concepts, uh, we have, you know, to make this a little more concrete, uh, AP, the API has a notion of, of queues, or you can think of these as topics. Um, and, and then, of course, we have messages and then claims uh, I, I already mentioned. So these are pretty straightforward. Um, now, each one of these has different kinds of operations. Um, a lot of what you would expect, uh, maybe a few things that you don't. So let me just take a couple minutes and walk through the different operations you can do on each resource. Um, the f first up, we have queues. Um, you can, of course, create a queue. <laughs> you can list queues. You can find out that can be useful for auto discovery, for example. Um, you can certainly delete them. Um, one interesting thing you can actually do with a queue is set metadata on it. So back to the invoicing example, uh, you could set a template into that queue metadata, and then your, your worker could pull that out and use that to construct the PDF file, for example, that you would then send to your customer. 
Uh, and then you can also get statistics for that queue. You can find out how many messages there are total, how many are claimed versus free. You can find out the, the oldest and the newest message. So we think this is going to be really useful for auto scale as well as um, just getting um, uh, a better insight into how your queues are behaving and, and, and whether or not they're getting backed up. So here's, here's just a quick example of how you, you create a queue. Um, you can see I, can, I am able to choose the name of that queue. And going back to the earlier example, I'm going to call it invoices. And here I'm going to set that template that I talked about before. Um, this is just a very simple example. And then, uh, of course, I can go ahead and get that. So my, my, my worker would need to get that template back out of the queue metadata. So that's, here's an example of how you might do that. And um, of course, I can always list those queues. And I, if I pass uh, an optional query parameter detailed true, I can get the metadata there as well. Um, and this can be useful if I'm trying to auto-discover uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, queues I'm dealing with. Or you can imagine for a, for a horizon or for some kind of control surface, this could be useful. Uh, and then, of course, you can delete. Some message operations. Again, it's kind of the usual suspects. You can post messages. You can, you can get a single message. You can list those messages, much as you would um, like with an Atom or an RSS feed with pagination. Uh, and of course, you can delete messages. So I'll just show you briefly what a message looks like. You, you set a time to live, which uh, controls the lifetime of that message. Here, I'm setting it for five minutes. And then I'm setting a arbitrary payload. This is. Uh, as long as it's valid JSON, um, you can submit whatever you like. So it's up to the application to interpret that. So here I'm, I'm just maybe setting some, uh, some information you might find useful in generating an invoice. And uh, there's just a quick example of, of posting that and getting back the, uh, a, a link to the posted message. Um, again, this is an example of how I might list those messages. Uh, one thing I'll just call out here, as you can see, the, the pagination is, is there using the kind of a RESTful design. We've tried really hard to make this a clean, modern HTTP API. All right, so uh, last one is uh, things you can do with claims. Um, of course, you can create a claim. When you create a claim, it grabs, it, it goes to the head of the queue and finds um, a certain, it, it, so if I ask for, five messages, it'll go find the first five messages that haven't been claimed by anyone yet, and then return that to me. Um, and then I can, I can always just read the claim directly. I can refresh a claim, um, because claims can actually expire. And uh, I can also delete claim messages, et cetera. Uh, just really quick how this looks. Uh, here I'm, I'm creating a claim. I'm saying I. I want it to live for one minute. I think I can process all the messages there within a minute. And uh, that's useful because if my worker crashes, then the system will automatically fr free release that claim and the messages can be reclaimed by another worker. And um, here I'm passing a limit of two, so I'm asking for a maximum of two messages. OK. so. Uh, once I get those messages, I'll do my processing. In the example, I will create that PDF file. Maybe I'll email it out. And once I'm done, uh, I'll delete that message so that it doesn't end up getting processed by a different worker. And you can see there where I'm passing the claim ID. So that ensures that only uh, the worker that created the claim is able to delete that message. OK, so um, that was a very quick walk through. If you want to dig into the details, uh, go to our wiki page. We are um, planning to do um, some proper user documentation, but right now um, everything's just kind of on the wiki. So uh, with that, I'd like to invite uh, Flavio Percoco up from Red Hat. He's going to discuss the architecture and some deployment options that you have with Marconi. So hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Kurt, for the introduction. So yeah, as Kurt said, I work for Red Hat. I'm a software engineer there, uh, mostly oriented on the storage side. But I'm also working on Marconi, uh, like a broker developer, actually. But anyway, um, so I will now go through the whole architecture. And I will give you a 
really quick introduction to, to Marconi's architecture and how we built the whole, this whole thing. Uh, so this is a very high level overview of what we have right now. Uh, we have the, so basically it's split in three different layers uh, that we can play with basically, like if they were Lego bricks. We have the first layer is the transport layer. Uh, it allows, so we created this because we wanted people to be able to deploy Marconi and be able to use different transports for it. So those of you who don't like using HTTP for messaging can you use some TCP transport and talk to Marconi through TCP or use 0MQ as a, you know, as a way to send messages to Marconi. And Marconi then will then process those messages and do something useful with them. We then have uh, the API layer, where, which is where we define the whole API. Uh, so this is basically, this is mostly a logical representation of how Marconi works. Uh, we will split this uh, in three different packages, basically, in the next few months. But the API and the transport layer are in the same package right now. So the API is, is where the API, the API layer is where the API is defined. It's basically a couple of classes and, and specs that uh, represent the whole, uh, the whole, Mar the, the whole Marconi API. Um, it allows to you know, have validations, pipelines, and have a different way to expose that through different transports. So transport, when, when you start a transport, when you start Marconi and it loads the transport, it will read the whole API spec from the API layer, and it will create the, the, the endpoints and will expose those endpoints dynamically. And it will also allow us to have, at some point, maybe extensions so that people can actually create different endpoints and plugins based on their own needs. Uh, that may not make sense to have inside the code base. Then we have the storage layer. Uh, that's where the whole persistency uh, of messages happen. We right, now, right now we have a NoSQL backend, which is based on MongoDB, and we have a, an SQL backend, which is based on SQLite. Uh, we are replacing the SQLite one for a SQL Alchemy-based one. So we have support for MySQL, PostgreSQL, and SQLite, and whatever SQL Alchemy can support. And we are also working, in the, in the next couple of months, we'll be working on, it, on the first NQP backend for Marconi. Um, yeah, so basically the storage layer allows you to, you know, like playing around with what backend you want to use and what backend you want to have in your infrastructure. So one of the philosophies we have in Marconi is that we don't want to be invasive. We want you to be able to deploy Marconi with whatever you are already using. We don't want you to, get a new storage, get a new broker, and get to know that broker yet again in a new API or whatever. You, you already know how to deploy, let's say, Cupid, right? You already know how to have HA with it and how to distribute it in your infrastructure. We just want to give you a nice API on top of those technologies that you can basically develop things on and then make them portable at the same time. So that's basically what the architecture of Marconi looks like. It's very simple, it's very straightforward, there's no magic in there, there are just interfaces, I know that word is ugly, but there are some interfaces there that you can basically use to you know, create your own transport or create a backend for your own technology or the one that's missing in there. Um, yeah, and I'll now go through some ways of, of deploying Marconi. Um, just like the API, deploying Marconi is very simple. It's like I said, it's like playing with Lego bricks. You can pick whatever you want, right? Tell Marconi where it is, and Marconi will talk to that uh, storage or, or we expose that transport as you choose. Um, the first way to deploy Marconi, the simplest one, is single storage. You have a Marconi instance of several Marconi instances that you can scale out horizontally, and then you're talking to the same, to the, to one single cluster of storage, right? You have your MongoDB cluster, your MySQL cluster, or whatever you're using, and you point Marconi to that cluster, and you scale that cluster as much as you want. The second way to deploy Marconi is to, having, is to have several different backends uh, deployed at the same time. Basically, Marconi has this uh, really cool feature called partition that we, we introduced that allow you to not just scale your, for example, your NQP broker, like having different clusters of it and tell it like these, kind, these type of queues will go to the cluster A and the other list of queues will go to the cluster B, but it also allows you to um, have different backends at the same time. You can also deploy like a Redis cluster along with a MySQL cluster along with a RabbitMQ cluster based on your needs, right? It's kind of more work to do for DevOps and the whole deployment process, but if, you, if that's something that you can find useful. For example, one use case for that is like having all not 
persistent messages going to Redis, for example, that you don't want, you don't care if they are lost, say if Redis fails or whatever, you don't care about those messages. So you have these non-persistent non messages there that have really high performance because Redis is fast. And then if you care about those messages, you can move them to some persistent backend like MySQL, SQL Alchemy, or whatever you choose, right? So it basically allows you to do many things. And then you can always scale Marconi horizontally. You can uh, start many instances and have some uh, HA proxy on top of it, which is basically what is in this slide here. We, ha we have we have split the admin API from the public API, so you can just bind the admin API to some private network, to some private interface, and then expose the whole public API. Then the admin API basically does whatever the public API does, plus has some admin endpoints that you can use to monitor your, your Marconi uh, instance and, and, and what's happening in your infrastructure. And then, like I said, you can have an H proxy on top of those public API and, and balance those things. And if you need to scale more, you can start more Marconi instances and tell them where the storage is and they will find it and will talk to, talk to those storage. So basically, you, can ha you have to scale two areas, right? If you want to make Marconi scale, you have to scale the whole Marconi instances and you have to also scale the backends for it, right? If you already know how to scale those backends, you just have to start more Marconi instances and you're done. And with this, which was very, very quick. I'll introduce you to uh, Alan Matz, who's a Rackspace manager, director, what? <laughs> and he's going to demo uh, Marconi to you and, and what you have done and what they have done in their cloud. Sure, thanks. Yeah, my name is Alan. I, uh, I'm the director of engineering uh, for, uh, at the Rackspace's Atlanta office. Um, we're the team that uh, has been responsible for taking the Marconi um, API um, from OpenStack and actually creating a Cloud Cues product. So that's what this, uh, the Marconi is, is known as in Rackspace. It's a product called Cloud Cues. Um, so what we've done is basically um, we have uh, connected Marconi up. Um, we've made it, given it a presence on our, our standard uh, um, control panel. So over here on this uh, side, we actually have the Cues tab. Um, which um, what I've actually done is, uh, you know, Rackspace has six data centers. Um, so just for the purposes of this demo, I've actually created a queue um, in each of those six data centers. Uh, so we have a queue in, uh, in Dallas, Hong Kong, uh, Northern Virginia, London, Chicago, and Sydney. We use three-letter uh, airport codes for, uh, to designate our, um, our data centers. So, um, so we've done this. Uh, we've also tied in um, um, into our software development kits uh, at Rackspace uh, some client bindings so that um, we have client bindings for Python, um, Ruby, Java, uh, and .NET at this time. Um, so I'm going to basically just do a real simple demo just to kind of run some, some messages through. This is actually NGA. Um, we, uh, we announced... Um, a live uh, production release uh, on Monday. Um, and so what I've done is I've basically created uh, a queue in every data center, and then I also have a server running in every data center. So if you look over here, I've got servers that are by the same name. Um, and so what's going to happen here is I'm going to send, let's say I'll send 100 messages. Um, oops, we got a broken, oh, sorry, my SSH connection here. All right, so now we're back. Um, so I am going to run it. This is a simple little utility I wrote to make things easy. I'm going to send uh, 100 messages to London. Uh, um, and so what's, what this is going to do is basically 100 messages are going to go into the London queue. And then I have these servers set up so that um, each one is going to pull messages from that queue and it's going to send it to the next queue in the chain. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to send 100 messages around the world. Um, so we just connected to London and go back to the queues thing here. And we should see some of these messages start to run through. Um, so these, uh, there's 11 messages in flight in London. These are going to go really fast. So if I go back here, 
Um, so it, basically we're going from London to Northern Virginia, to Chicago, um, to Dallas, to Sydney, and we should end up in Hong Kong here. So looks like we got 69. I'm not going to wait for those to show up, but they should get there eventually. But let's just go ahead and take a look at um, what's in one of these, Python. OK, so we have all 100 now. Uh, show message. So first message in Hong Kong, HKG. And there we go. So that's the content of the first message in the queue. And basically, it, um, every time it visited a data center, uh, it basically just posted a message that said, um, I was here, and I forwarded it to the next queue. So that's a quick little demo. Uh, I think we're going to come up and answer some questions. Um, I think Kurt's got some frequently asked questions to, to walk you all through, and then we'll take questions. So come on back up. All right, so as you saw, uh, Marconi is real. It's uh, ready for production, and we are continuing to work on it and refine it. Um, so we're really excited for the future there, and uh, just a big thank you to um, the folks at Red Hat, and uh, we, we've had some interns helping out as well, and all the, all the guys at Rackspace for getting the project to this point. <coughs> so I'll bring this up here. Um, uh, before we get to the Q&A session, I just wanted to cover a few uh, questions that a lot of people ask us, um, <clears throat> and then we're happy to take some general questions from you. The first one is, uh, we, we do get asked a lot, um, what's, uh, are, are we going to be able to plug in Marconi to our, our existing uh, RabbitMQ, oh, lost it, into our existing RabbitMQ? Infrastructure and and as uh, Flavio said, we are we're trying to work with whatever you already have deployed, whatever you have uh, expertise in already. Um, so we we actually had a design session on this earlier today, and um, we're looking at planning that for our, our version two API. So that'll be coming later next year. Uh, we are. Uh, it, it looks like we want to do this for a back end. We're not sure if uh, a name QP transport would be useful. So we'd love to hear your use cases. Um, come talk to us and let us know what you would like there. And of course, um, if, you have, uh, folk, if you have engineers that would like to contribute to the project, we're always happy to, to help them to uh, take their, their uh, patches. Uh, another question we get is, you know, the obvious one, how does this compare to what Amazon offers? Uh, Amazon has their SQS and SNS services. We are actually, we are targeting similar workloads to what they have. Uh, one difference, though, is we, are, we have a unified API, so the, the SQS and SNS are, are two completely separate services and APIs, and they, uh, with Marconi, we brought, we're, we're trying to tackle those in the same API, but in a more flexible manner. So we, instead of saying you, ha you have to, you do uh, work queuing this way, and then if you want to send email messages out when something happens, you do it this way. We want to give you more of a, a, a flexible, creative platform and see what you can come up with. So just a couple of the quick differences. Uh, we, we actually do have uh, guaranteed first in, first out for a single producer and a once and only once delivery, which um, at least with SQS, Amazon does not guarantee. Uh, and as Flavio mentioned, that's probably going to depend on what kind of backends that you deploy. Um, <clears throat> but uh, for some of our drivers, we will have that available for people who would like that. And then, of course, since it's uh, open source and, and you saw that architecture, it's very customizable. Um, just a couple more questions we get. Uh, the, people are wondering how mature it is. Um, you saw that we're actually running this in production in Rackspace today. And um, <coughs> we have a growing community of, of contributors and users. I know Flavio's been really active in the, uh, the broader community, going to meetups and uh, conferences and talking about Marconi. And, and we're, uh, we're, we're getting more and more contributors outside Rackspace and Red Hat so we're really excited about that. Um, we actually have uh, also got an uh, intern from the 
GNOME uh, outreach program for women who's uh, going to be doing some work for us on our API. So, so we're, we're moving along, we're growing, we're excited about the future. We have some things coming up. Um, we're going to polish up our, our 1.0 API uh, over the next few months and release a 1.1 so that by the time we're integrated with Icehouse, uh, everyone has a nice clean API to start out with because we envision that API being around for a number of years. Um, <clears throat> We are uh, looking at additional storage drivers right now. As Flavio said, we have a MongoDB driver and just a basic SQLite driver for testing. But um, we're looking at uh, all kinds of other options there. For example, Redis or AMQP for different types of workloads. And uh, we're also uh, getting ready to merge in uh, this storage sharding, which allows you to do application layer sharding so I can have multiple Mongo clusters or MySQL clusters, and I can distribute those queues across there. And that will allow us to scale to massive proportions, which is really important when you're running a public cloud. Uh, and just a few other things, uh, the notifications part, we're, gonna, we're looking at uh, adding a few more things that'll make SNS type workloads possible, connecting up um, messages and alerts to like text messages or push alerts for phones or sending out emails. And um, then we just have a few other things going on. Um, we're working with the Keystone team to add message signing and some other neat stuff. So we invite you to get involved, let us know what you want, um, and uh, help us design the future of Marconi. All right, yes. Yeah, let's get let, let's get Alan and Flavio up here, and we can. There we go. Currently, we have AMQP as such in the uh, RabbitMQ. Uh, we call it usually protocol, and you call it storage, and it does support the calling, casting, those kinds of topics, and all that it supports. So, are you externalizing it? And one that is one. And second, if you externalize, can I do whatever I want to do uh, within the open stack as if, if I want to create another module, let's say, independent module like you have yourself created right now. For you, you will have your own queue based on AMQP right now, assuming. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, there's a little confusion on that because um, the, the support that we're talking about for AMQP is actually using it as kind of a persistence layer, which is a little strange because you usually think of like a database or something for that. Um, we, are, it, it, we are actually providing uh, a general abstraction over um, other uh, queuing protocols. So we, it's kind of uh, up in the air whether we would do an AMQP transport because it doesn't cleanly map to the semantics that, we're, that we have defined today. Um, but we're, we'd love to talk about that and find out your use cases again about that. Um, uh, does that make sense? Oh, I see, yes. There are some other benefits besides the, the, the API or the protocol you use to talk to Marconi. You, with Marconi, you have portability that you maybe won't have. If you want to change from a broker to another broker, you will not be able to port your application from one point to another point. So Marconi, we, what gives you is actually uh, cross-cloud portability. You can basically take the same application you use to talk to one OpenStack cloud, one OpenStack infrastructure environment, and you can take the same application and make it talk to another one where Marconi is deployed as well. So it's not just about a protocol. We can support a protocol. There's, there's a way to do that, right? We have, we have transport plugins, so you can basically create a transport for AMQP if you want, and you can create a transport for, I don't know, S3, because you may want to use Bota to talk to Marconi, and then just, just make it interpret that stuff and pass that to the API and go down the whole change. But it's not just about API. There are ways to do that to make it even more portable, because if, you're, if you already have your application that talks to an MQP broker, you 
having an MQP transfer will give you that portability from that model, to, from that application to Marconi. But you know. Yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I mean, at some point you got to scope it. Um, I mean, one of the one of the major things you get is a clean, modern HTTP API that works with um, non-persistent connections. Um, one of the, the things you have trouble with with AMQP is going across, you know, network boundaries, going through firewalls, and also for scaling, um, it's extremely difficult to get, say, a hundred thousand clients talking to a single AMQP cluster. But you could do that with Marconi using the HTTP transport. Um, so like I said, I don't know if it makes sense to have an AMQP transport, because at that point, maybe you might as well just deploy like a, a Qubit or RabbitMQ. Um, uh, but we are still kind of filling that out. So that's great feedback. Thank you. Other questions? Um, I, I have two questions. The first one is that you, you tell us that you, you, you are able to share in between different backends. And I understood, I understood the use case when, for some example, some queues needs to be persistent and so on not. My question is, what, what was unclear to me is that how do you do the sharding? Is this the role of the Marconi server to share? Or if this is something um, that the user has to explicitly say. That's something which is a bit unclear. Oh, okay. What? Did you, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, let me clarify that for you. The, the sharding is, is really not something, we're, we don't want to necessarily surface that to the user, um, but is that there are two uses for sharding. I think this will help clear it up. One w is simply to scale horizontally. So if I want to have um, 100 MongoDB uh, replication sets, for example, and I want to just keep going out, I can use the sharding feature to distribute those queues across all of those backend storages. So I can just keep adding and adding and adding. So that's one thing. Now, um, the nice, uh, there's, it's almost a side effect, but it does open the possibility to have, like we said, uh, heterogeneous backend, so I could maybe have a pool of Redis clusters, a pool of MongoDB, and then the user can specify uh, what kind of a queue they want. So they don't know that it's going to Redis or MySQL. They just say, I want super fast, but I don't care so much about FIFO or persistence. Okay, we put that on Redis. Or, you know, I want super high durability. I'm okay with some of the trade-offs, so we'll put that on the MongoDB cluster. So that, makes sense. So, so, so that was my question. Yeah. Uh, is, the, is the kind of backend exposed to the user so he could, I would say, explain which kind of backend yeah. he wants and then leave the, leave the implementation up to, up to Marconi? I, as you said, uh, do I have any way to specify when creating a queue which kind of uh, super fast backend I have or that yeah, kind yeah. of thing? So that, that's not in the API today, but um, I can imagine sort of a, like a queue flavor concept in the future where when I create a queue, I can say, I want this flavor. Okay. Can I oh. So I just wanted to add something to what uh, Kurt said. Um, the whole sharding stuff in Marconi is not that Marconi will split your data between two different uh, Backends. So when you create a queue in a backend, the queue will exist in that backend just there. The, the message is going to that queue won't be split in several backends because that would, we wouldn't be able to guarantee FIFO otherwise, right? So the whole idea is if your storage supports sharding, that's something that you will handle in the storage side, right? So if MongoDB, since MongoDB has sharding and you want to shard MongoDB, you will do that at the MongoDB level. For Marconi, there are separate clusters that he it can talk to it can talk to and you will simply say like these queues here go there and the other queues go in the other side. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. So we're so the app, so the application layer sharding is happening at the queue level, not the message level. Um, you can use the, the the native storage sharding for if you want to do message sharding. I've got a question over here. I was wondering what uh, languages you support. Do you have client bindings that you ship? So yeah, right now uh, we're working on a Python library. Obviously, it's the first one. It's the most complete one. There are there's support for queues, and then there's support for messages already, and we're working on the claim part. And those patches should lie in the next couple of weeks. And there's also some hack on a Haskell library, but that's, that doesn't have much working yet, but there's some work going on there. I hope there, are, there will be more libraries very soon. Yeah, uh, Rackspace has, as part of Rackspace's SDKs, like Alan mentioned, we do support um, Java and, um, what else is it? Java.net. Java.net, Ruby, and Python right now. Yeah, right now. So um, hopefully so we, we can contribute some of that. I, I believe they should work with generic OpenStack clouds. They're not necessarily Rackspace specific. So, um, but we hope the community will contribute more there for sure. Other questions? Yeah. How easy is to jump on the project? Do we have to deal with things like DevStack or it's easier, hopefully? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, let's see, how easy it is, is it to jump on the project? Um, well, it's probably one of the, I mean, it's, it's definitely one of the simpler projects in OpenStack. Like, you can get up to speed very quickly with the code. Um, we have a fairly small team right now. We're, we, we're very active in the IRC channel. You can see that up there. And uh, we have a good time there. So um, I think uh, the... Uh, do you want to talk about the experience maybe of, of, of our intern and how she's doing? Sure. So um, I think the first, the first thing you have to figure out is where you want to work at in Marconi, right? So it's not that you, if you are working on the transport layer, you won't be working on the back end layer. You still have to know the whole thing. But we try to you know, keep us focused on some things so we don't mess up, like conflicting patches and whatever. And we can keep the, the whole knowledge of what we are doing a, a little bit more, you know, isolated and, 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 you know, but we still talk about everything in the RSC channel anyway. So once you do that, you can jump obviously on, on Launchpad and start getting some bugs. There are tons of bugs because we create bugs even for the most really lame things because we want to, you know, remember them and we want to have low hanging fruits for people to jump into a project. And that's basically what we do. We just go there, create things, and if we haven't fixed them, a good way to jump into a project is like go in there and pick in uh, one of those bugs and start fixing them. Uh, another good way to jump into a project is start working on the client side. The client side, I mean, the client library for Python, it's there. It's still missing some pieces, like claim, but it will definitely give you the whole picture of the whole project. And once you know what, how the project looks like, what the API looks like, it will be straightforward to get into a project and start coding on it. So we're out of time. We got one more question here. <coughs> Do I understand that correctly? Is it <coughs> Marconi will be used to collect the notifications that are generated by the uh, OpenStack different component? That is that is the idea, isn't it? So the idea is not to replace uh, what OpenStack is using right now for messaging. So the idea is not to replace the RabbitMQ instance or the QP instance uh, OpenStack is using. It, it is possible, there is not the idea. The idea is to have a queuing service for OpenStack. We will have uh, integration with uh, Sailometer and Heat and Horizon because those projects want to use Marconi for notification and for queuing, but that's not what will be used for by the whole infrastructure. Yeah, the, 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 like the Salometer project and, and those folks, they are interested in surfacing some notifications to users. So. We are, we are very focused on, on the, uh, the cloud users, the application developers. Um. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you.